True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht and you're listening to my interview with Dr. Gerard Labaskakni, author of The Profiler Diaries 2, From Crime Scene to Courtroom. This episode is sponsored by Dialabed. If you're listening to this podcast in bed, you should know that the quality of each day is decided the night before. Sleep your way to a new and more vibrant you. Behind every mover and shaker, there is a perfect mattress. And Dialabed has your back with South Africa's widest range of bed brands. Upgrade your bed today by visiting a Dialabed store or shopping online at dialabed.co.za. A huge thank you to Dialabed for supporting True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Bernice Thomas, Marcel Herbst, Yaku Tate, Ku Marie van Heerden, Carla, Marlene Bailey, and Lisa Kraus for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout-out and monthly exclusive episode that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon. So if you prefer not to hear the ads, head over to Patreon and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, Print Crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discount and support the show at the same time. And you can get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. If you've listened to more than one of my episodes, you'll already be very familiar with the name Gerard Labaskakni. I refer to his work, both academic and practical within the SAPS, regularly. And, of course, I interviewed him in March last year when he released his first book. So when I heard he had a follow-up to The Profiler Diaries out, there was no doubt that I was going to ask for another interview. I read Profiler Diaries to in one day, because I literally could not put it down. It was delivered at 9am, and by 5pm, I closed the back cover. Very simply, it's brilliant. While Gerard focused much more on his career path to becoming a forensic psychologist, threat assessment professional, head of the SAPS's investigative psychology section, and the million other things he's done in his first book, The second book is a lot more focused on the cases, and as the subtitle suggests, he doesn't just stop at the arrest and spends a lot more time discussing how the cases were successfully prosecuted, which is very interesting. The cases selected for this book include a really wide range of important themes, and I think he did a great job of picking stories that would provide a lot of food for thought. On the very off chance that you don't know who Dr. Gerard Labaskakni is, here's the short version. As head of the SAPS's IPS for 14 years, he profiled more than 300 offenders, which makes him one of the most experienced profilers in the world. After he resigned from the SAPS, he went into threat assessment and now has his own company, L&S Threat Management. He's regularly interviewed on television and radio as an expert in a wide range of crime-related topics. He's also a criminologist, 
an admitted advocate and a member of about 14 million different associations. Okay, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but it's a lot. So let's get into my interview with Dr. Gerard Labuskakni, author of The Profiler Diaries 2, From Crime Scene to Courtroom. In my first interview with Gerard, we chatted about how writing the first Profiler Diaries book was quite an experience for him. He did it during the initial lockdown, and considering it was something that people had been begging him to do since he resigned from SAPS, it felt like a monumental task at first, he said. I wondered how that experience had coloured the journey of writing the second book, and if there was anything he'd learned the first time round that he applied to the Profiler Diaries too. I think with writing the second book, you know, I was just grateful the first one did reasonably well. I mean, obviously it did quite well by South African standards. And when I was first asked by Penguin, not too long after the first one, don't I write a, want to write a second one? I kind of delayed it and delayed it. I wasn't quite sure if I was up to the challenge. Uh, and, you know, do you want to push your luck? You know, the first one did really well. Nobody wants the sequel, you know, to not do well. I think it was partly the advance that they said they'd give me help to <laughs> really convince me in the end. Uh, obviously, this was still um, lockdown times, etc. cetera, last, uh, last year, yeah. So that, I think, I have to admit, was perhaps a bit of a, um, an additional incentive to actually say yes to the book. One of my big worries I've always was, you know, even with the first book, is, you know, selecting the cases, you know, interesting cases that I find interesting, that I think people would find interesting, that I did enough in the case to, to say that I could, you know, it's not just me telling someone else's story. And, of course, the, the bigger challenge is, do I have enough Info, because it's one thing, you know, chatting to people about a case, whether it be a presentation on PowerPoint or in a podcast, you know, people, when they read a book, expect a lot more detail. But when did that happen? You can't just say, and then later, well, how much later? A week? Uh, and then the detective, but what's the detective's name? So you have to have a lot of info that in a chat, you don't have to have. Uh, and, you know, the context is different and, and expectations are different. So it also became a challenge to make sure that I have enough case file info that I could literally plot everything. In addition to my story, I can actually tell in detail the story. So that was kind of challenging. And I'm, I'm quite happy, though. I do think that the, the, the stories I ultimately selected are interesting stories. A lot of them might have not been heard of at all by, before by people, which I think is nice that they, you know, it's not a story that you already know. And I must say, you know, I think it was sort of September where they asked me to do it. They give me a deadline. I initially end of December, but then they said, well, December is pointless. You know, nobody's at work, so let's make it middle of January. And I kind of quite happily wrote the first chapter and then kind of, I wouldn't say got sidetracked, but had other things that were going on that just took up my time. And then kind of I realized mid-November, I really have to get down and do this. And I really kind of from end of November, December, early Jan, you know, really churned out, I think, the remaining chapters. I think I'd written one prior to that and tinkered with another one. Uh, one. One story I started writing, then I kind of gave up because I didn't feel right at the time. I think I was going to include the the Janisburg Mind Dump serial murderer, um, Sipo Dube, and then I kind of abandoned that one for one that I just felt better about. And I think pretty much churned out the other five chapters pretty much November, December, and submitted them all uh, on time, thankfully. The cases presented in the book range from two quite well-known cases to one which I hadn't even heard about. And to me, they really seem to each represent a really interesting theme. I asked Gerard if there were any specific themes he'd wanted to present in the case selection. So there weren't necessarily, I mean, in the first book, if you look at it, I think almost all of them had an element of serial murder. They were either serial murder cases or a serial rapist we eventually realized was linked to two separate murders, or it was a serial murderer that they caught after the first incident, like to Zeta Silva. So it kind of, most of them actually ended up having a bit of a serial, serial flavor to them. You know, with these ones, I think I didn't want to just give serial. I think I've, people always, want, always enjoy serial cases, so I definitely wanted to include two, and I had the, the two that I did include were really interesting cases for different reasons. But... Um, there wasn't a particular theme, I would say. I wasn't trying to package, you know, 
have one of these, one of those, one of those. I just thought that they're really interesting and also a little bit, like I said, different. You know, the stalker case is quite different to the other stuff. The school attack is quite different. You know, the, the King of America is quite different. Whereas, you know, the Welcome, Nisden, and PE are kind of the good old fashioned gory murder types. But I want to bring perhaps a little bit more of a deeper psychological bit, I guess, to, to the cases. But yeah, in the end, you just got to hope that people enjoy them as much as you do and find them as fascinating as you do. And, and I think also with, you know, with specifically Krugerstorp, um, Brian the Stork and the King of America, you know, a lot of what I'm doing nowadays is more in the world of threat assessment. You know, I, and in those cases, definitely the Krugerstorp one and King of America were more really had f- feet in the world of threat assessment. And I want to perhaps just expose the readers to that angle of it. You know, how, how the Krugerstorp case could have been prevented if a threat assessment model had been implemented at the school, which I think all schools and tertiary education institutions should have. So it was a great opportunity to discuss something that I think for the average person, that's not even on the radar, you know, threat assessment, what on earth are you talking about? And same with the sort of King of America, you know, and Brian, again, stalking very much, a lot of threat assessments are about stalking cases, you know, what danger would someone pose to the victim or victims? You know, how do we assess how concerned we should be? So I think that was nice that I could bring that angle of exposing people to a different world. You know, forensic psychology or investigative psychology or profiling isn't just about who could have committed this gruesome murder. You know, it's often about other things that profilers do, and threat assessment is something that is a big part of, of, of the modern profiler's work. I thought that was a very important point. And I guess it goes to show that although we often see profiling as a reactive measure, Really, it's most beneficial when it is a proactive measure to actually mitigate the threat rather than chase it after the worst has already happened. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I love about the work I do now, primarily, is it's about preventing. You know, it's incredibly rewarding to, uh, you know, assess something, realize there's a problem, think out a strategy to make it not happen, and then have it not happen. It's like, well, that's great. Isn't that a win for everybody? You know, the suspect doesn't do something bad, which is bad for them. And of course, by them not doing something bad, nobody's harmed. That's like a win-win for everybody. Whereas your murder cases, you know, the person's dead. No matter what you do, you get the person convicted. You know, um, you can't undead them. Um, so it's kind of like the best option in the circumstances, get him convicted and stuck in jail. But it's not really, it's not a win for anybody. It's even the families, it's, it's a closure. But I'm sure they would all wish they had their family member back. So it's a sad kind of finalization or resolving of a case. One of the cases included in the Profiler Diaries, too, is the Mornay Haramsa case. In 2008, 18-year-old Haramsa killed Jacques Pretorius and attempted to kill three other people. He was convicted and sentenced to an effective 20 years in prison. Haramsa was released on parole in March this year. In the book, it's clear that the bulk of that chapter was written prior to Haramsa's release, and there's a note added after he was paroled. Gerard has been very vocal about his concerns about the man's release, and really, our parole system in general, which recent cases have come to show, has been found dangerously wanting. I asked Gerard what changes he'd like to see made to our current parole system. Well, I think you first have to start with when the person actually arrives in the prison in the first place. You know, if you don't know exactly what the person has done, if you only know he's been convicted of count A, B, and C, like I always say, the Velcro murder is one times murder. Oscar Pistorius is one times murder also, but they're very different people with very different risk profiles. You know, I definitely wouldn't want the Velcro couple back on the streets. Oscar Pistorius, I don't really have a big problem from a, from, a, from a risk point of view. I really don't have a problem with Oscar being back on the streets. I don't think he's a high risk for reoffending. So the problem is the correctional services don't know that. They don't get a copy of the police case file. They don't get a copy of the court record or even just the judgment, which would explain exactly what the person done. So this person arrives in the prison and can really spew any nonsense to whoever he's interacting with. And means they also don't necessarily have a proper program aimed at trying to mitigate some of the problematic things that they might have in their lives that need to be addressed. And then what happens is you get to parole and all of a sudden they do an assessment. Um, Again, how can you do a risk assessment if you don't actually know what the person did? Like I said, not all murders are the same. 
And then you have a parole board that has no experts sitting on it. You know, it's people who have been appointed, some of the, from the community, uh, there's supposed to be a policeman on the board. They receive the, the correctional service psychologist's report. They receive the social worker's report from correctional services. And they as lay people then decide what's relevant and what's not relevant and how much of a risk this person is. So you have people who actually don't have the proper skills and training to do that. Um, who then make these bizarre decisions that seem to be, for the most part, based on, well, he hasn't caused trouble in prison, let's give him a second chance. So their default setting seems to be that you probably should be released when you come up for parole hearings and only should be kept in if there's a really, 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 really good reason not to release you. And again, you know, when the, I would say when the court sentences you, they're looking at things like punishment, retribution, deterrence of you to do it again and deterrence from someone else trying to do this. Um, rehabilitation, a whole bunch of things before they give you your sentence. If the parole board's only looking at how well behaved have you been, you know, you might be rehabilitated after two years of being in prison, but have you finished being punished, which is part of what a sentence is about? So I think they totally focus on one aspect of what the judge gives when they give a sentence, only one tiny consideration. So I do think what, which would make me happy is a some personal responsibility. So when someone you release on parole does go to commit the same offense, you know, with, at least within his period of parole, I mean, after his parole is expired, that's a different story. You know, the, what you should be held accountable. You know, are we doing reviews of parole boards, seeing which ones mess it up more often than other ones and perhaps scrap that board or look at why they're messing these things up? Are we looking at corruption? Because I mean, we always accept there's corruption between, you know, policeman and the accused, maybe even a prosecutor and the accused, there's even allegations of corruption between magistrates and, the, and judges and accused people. Why do we not think there's going to be the potential for corruption at the parole process when someone has the power to release you halfway through your prison sentence? If you don't think there's potential corruption there, you're an absolute idiot. So are there mechanisms built in place to monitor that whether or not there, are, there is corruption at the parole board level? And then I think having experts involved on the panel, not just you get the report and then you decide what's relevant to the report or not. Because we'll have people like in Monet's says where we said, absolutely no way, he's a huge dangerous society. And they're like, well, that's just one of the reports we consider. Well, it shouldn't just be one, it should be a very weighty consideration. So I think those kind of changes, accountability, professional people on the parole boards, monitoring their success, monitoring for corruption, those things, and then of course, having all the information would be huge leaps forward in making sure that we do what's responsible for society. Change doesn't just happen on its own though. And although DCS officials have claimed to be looking at restructuring the system, I wondered how Gerard thought these changes could actually be implemented. Well, I think the worst thing we can do is just leave it in their hands. Because they could go through this whole process, it could take a year or two, and we get something that's just as equally bad. I think it should be an open process. I think where members of the public get to contribute what they think should happen, you know, whether it's mechanisms for keeping mem family members involved, uh, up to date, whether that means a registration system online where people can put their details in for case A, B, and C, um, that they can be notified when things are happening. And, and I think there should be, as I said, an open process where, you know, NGOs to victims of family members can all say what they want to be happening when it comes to, um, you know, parole or not happening. But if we just leave it in their hands, I just unfortunately don't have much faith nowadays in government to even involve experts uh, that should be involved in these things. So I think the more the public and there's more transparency, the better for everybody. And then hopefully then what does get implemented is something that we've all to greater or lesser degree agreed to. In many of the cases I've discussed on the podcast where sex workers have been the victims of either single or serial murder, I've been concerned about the level of attention paid to these cases. In the Profiler Diaries too, one of the cases Gerard discusses is Rion Stunder, who at the time of his serial crimes was known as the Port Elizabeth sex worker killer. Violence against those participating in sex work is a huge issue. And one set of stats I looked at indicated that more than half of all sex workers who died in 2019 were murdered. I wondered what Gerard's experience was with how the SAPS approaches violence against sex workers, and would such murders possibly be more difficult to solve because they were very often stranger murders? 
so in general, SAPS is attitude. I mean, I, it's difficult to say because, of course, you know, you, you might, there could be anything from a, a sex worker going to a police station to report to being raped. I would never even know about sort of those cases. I can, I can only say that the cases where we got involved and in, which would, again, would be typically your serials, you know, we, we took it just as seriously whether it was a sex worker or, or not. I mean, a lot of the time we didn't even know who our victims were because they weren't identified. So for us, it never really mattered who the victim was, I, but definitely I would imagine for a lot of policemen, they don't treat them at all um, appropriately and dismiss them and dismiss their complaints and, and themselves are abusing um, sex workers. That's definitely, definitely as in terms of a targeted group. And I always say, you know, nobody's career aspiration was to be a sick, a, specifically a street sex worker. You know, and people end up there because of terrible circumstances. And we saw in, in, in that chapter, you know, these, these people are little kids that they're trying to also support. So for me, it was never an issue that these are lesser people. But of course, we have to accept that a lot of people in society do view them very, very differently and very negatively, and including police. So I can imagine, I mean, for various reasons, they don't want to go forward. I mean, you're involved in a criminal activity. Our law, you know, obviously currently says it's illegal which makes you vulnerable to go to the police to report something when you yourself are involved in a criminal activity, will you be taken seriously? So I think those are just some of the considerations um, that, that they unfortunately have to face and that they don't. I mean, I know after I left the police, I did, one sex worker contacted me about rapes. She'd picked up herself being the victim with one particular client, you know, put that, in, you know, referred that to my old unit and they eventually did catch the guy and, you know, get him convicted. And, but, but again, she was very, very brave that she was quite comfortable to testify and for it to be known that she's a sex worker, but most people don't want to. So, yes, yeah, so investigating these kind of crimes can be more difficult because like we saw in, in Rian Stunner's case, you know, people don't want to be seen as cooperating with the police. Um, you know, their pimps don't want them to. Uh, we're not sure sometimes if the pimp is the murderer. So there's, again, a lot of secrecy um, in that sense, and like you say, stranger cases, because there's typically no prehistory between these two people. In the book, Gerard mentions that the area in which Stander's victims was found was a relatively safe suburb. One of the victims was found in an enclosed area, which then indicated that the perpetrator had to have access. But I wondered, if Gerard were drawing up a profile on a perpetrator, would the area the victims were found in be taken into consideration or influence the type of person he thinks might be committing the crimes? Yeah, I mean, we always look at, you know, what is this area? Is this a high crime area? Is it a low crime area? Do we believe this is just a, you know, disposal, body disposal area? But I mean, we do know from sort of some from research that very often your offender has some association with the area. I mean, he will typically know beforehand that if I, you know, this is this, that's a great place to dispose of a body. Um, maybe it's just a place he drives through on the way to work every day. So definitely area and the suspect having some association with the area is very common in, in the world of geographical profiling. So that, yes, we would typically consider this person has some, some link to the area. But of course, the next question is, what could that link be? You know, a resident, uh, a worker, ex-worker, ex-resident. Or is this a transitory place from, from, from work to residence that he goes through every day? So we unfortunately don't always know that, but we would definitely consider it as a potential, you know, you know, from a geographical profiling point of view, our suspect operates in this area for some reason that he has history with it. One of the most surprising things about the Stander case was that he was released on bail, which is very uncommon in serial murder cases. And I wondered whether the court may have seen that the alleged victims were all sex workers, and perhaps the judge thought that this meant that only a small portion of the community was at risk, so it wasn't a major threat to release Stander on bail. No, I mean, in the court, I mean, it's not impossible the court could have felt that, but of course the court could never say that because people are people in respect of what your job is. So I think, look, I mean, when I first heard that, he, when I got involved and I heard he's on bail, I mean, both my colleague, Colonel DeLonga, Jan DeLonga and myself had like literally heart attack, like how? But when you hear how the case unfolded and the fact that at that point they had no evidence against him, you know, he was, he started to, started the sort of confession, but then the, the pointing out was sort of interrupted. So we had nothing. We didn't have a formal confession. And unfortunately him just telling the cops that he did it is not admissible in court. So we had nothing at that point, or they had nothing at that point, which actually directly linked into the crime. So yes, we, we have possible blood, 
But possible blood isn't confirmed blood, and it's not confirmed blood that belongs to one of your victims. You have to do DNA analysis. So at that point, I mean, I do understand, you know, would we have tried to do it differently? Yes, but I think I understand at that point that, um, you know, they, they really had nothing to actually say there's a good, strong case against this guy. And that is a reason to give someone bail as if there's a weak case by the state. And there was nothing at all. It all hinged then later on the forensic uh, information. Like I said, if they'd managed to get the pointing out done, that would have been definitely a, a clear tool to use to oppose bail. And in fact, it was even sort of by gutsy of the prosecutor to, to agree to put, put the case on the, on the roll for, for bail purposes, because the prosecutor could have said, look, there's nothing here. Oh, I'm going to withdraw this against this guy. And when you've got enough info, you know, then come back to me for an arrest, arrest warrant. But I think Dion Honnacombe, the detective, who was really, really an amazing detective, said, no, he pushed it, convinced the prosecutor, because then at least we have bail conditions and we know where he's going to be. We know where he's not supposed to be. We know what he's supposed to be doing and what he's not supposed to be doing. And if he transgresses that, theoretically, you can uh, pull, that, uh, pull that bail back in. Another thing that was really interesting to me was that Stunder was out on bail for almost two years. As a now convicted serial murderer, I wondered how it was possible that he hadn't continued to commit murders while he was out on bail. Look, I mean, yeah, we do say these guys typically carry and carry on until they're, you know, stuck in jail. But I mean, at the same time, you know, they're they're not idiots. They know that the world is watching, that their family is watching, maybe the local police, etc., is keeping tabs on them, and if bodies start to pop up, they're going to be suspect number one. So, you know, they're not stupid, uh, but yes, you do wonder what was happening with that urge. Did he try and satisfy it in other ways? Um, you know, in fantasy world, in sort of masturbatory stuff, but maybe he did pick up sex workers, do something to them, maybe not necessarily kill them. We, we don't know, and, and, but nothing, we could never ever link anything else. I mean, we had old series in that general area because he came up to Gauteng for his... Um, bail he had to come back to his parents i think it was to stay with his parents and if we were looking into him then for being responsible for some older other series in those areas but that it was never dna linked to any of those another case which i think was a really smart selection for the book was the brian harvey case brian harvey committed digital stalking crimes he sent harassing messages to women including videos and photographs of him masturbating i think this case brings to the fore some really important and very relevant issues, not just around stalking, but also about online harassment in general. And I'm certain that many people are going to identify with what his victims experienced. For me, sending unsolicited nude images is really the digital version of someone walking up to you in the street and flashing you. We tend to take indecent exposure like that in the so-called real world pretty seriously because of the threat of escalation. So I wondered whether we perhaps shouldn't be equally concerned about escalation in cyber flashing. Or does the distant nature of the crime speak to an offender who's less likely to take it further? You always have to monitor. I mean, it's impossible to say, okay, this is a guy, he's sending cyber stuff, he's never going to get worse than that. I mean, that no one can predict human behavior like that. So we always say you have to monitor things. You know, is there a change in the pace of delivery of, of messages in the format? You know, maybe it's, it starts, you know, first thing it's WhatsApp messages, the next thing you get hold of your email and he's sending you emails and then you get something posted to you, you know, there's a change in the format of the stalking behavior. Uh, the severity, you know, is it becoming the words may be used along with it or more concerning or something that indicates that they've actually been trying to surveillance you, you know, you know, oh, I see you were at the Starbucks yesterday, you know, nice red pants you were wearing. And those are the types of things that we, we look at to determine whether there's an increase in potential harm for the victim. But that always has to be monitored because that harm can go up, that harm can go down. And, and sometimes you find that the, 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 the digital stalking is just part of the wider stalking, you know, like it might have started more generic and, and old fashioned and then move over into this. Or this becomes another format in which the stalking is actually taking place, along with other methods of stalking. So, yes, it can be just cyber based by itself. Um, we would still want to keep track of that and monitor it. 
but it often can also be part of a bigger pattern of stalking behavior where he's doing non-cyber stuff, you could say. I think that many, many women are going to read the chapter on Brian Harvey and resonate with it to some extent. The more the world has shifted to the digital realm, the more we're seeing women as well as men receiving unsolicited nude images from complete strangers on the internet, or even people that they've maybe just been chatting with, perhaps with a view to some form of more intimate connection, but all of a sudden the other person sends this random nude picture through. One American study I looked at said that two in three women will have received an unsolicited nude image on some platform in their digital lifetime. Colloquially, they're referred to as dick pics. But I think that term excludes the fact that many females engage in the same behaviour. This random sending of nude images of oneself without being asked for them has always fascinated me. Um, the psychology behind it has, not the actual pictures. Let's be very clear on that. So I asked Gerard what would generally be the psychology behind the sending of those types of images. What are these people hoping to achieve by sending them? Or is the psychological benefit just in knowing that someone is looking at them? Yeah, look, I think, you know, I think it's quite varied. I think for some people it is about the sexting, the sexual arousal. Hopefully you'll get a person to respond back. I mean, you know, if, if you've ever been on a, you know, speak to my friends, female friends on platforms like Tinder or other dating sort of apps, it's like, it's like, it's almost invariably the guy starts sending pictures or wants you to send pictures. And I think there's obviously that the sexual excitement around that, um, which for some of these guys, that is what it is about. And hopefully you would just stay at that. And the fantasy that somebody's going to respond and they will have this sort of sexting back and forth. And for others, like I think Brian, it was about knowing it's like pushing the boundary, getting a response, but knowing he's very safe, that nobody's going to be able to track him in his own little world that he thought. So I think it could be that. I think it could be obviously more predatory um, to cause, to intentionally cause fear. So I think that the motives are, are quite varied, which will then also come back to the sort of risks that, that each of these might pose uh, to a person physically. Although sexting has become a big part of online dating culture, and I discussed the dangers of sending nude images online in my interview with Colonel Clark on digital sex crimes, there's something else that stands out for me in this context, and that is consent. I think that we may view physical sex acts and digital sex acts as somehow different, but for me, I don't think they really are that different. The basis of both needs to be consent. And if you're just comfortably chatting with someone online about everyday things, and they suddenly decide it's appropriate to send you a nude picture of themselves without discussing it with you, they've taken away your consent. At the very least, they've shown you that they have very little regard for your consent. And to me, that's a huge red flag. If they already don't respect your right to consent digitally, how are they going to behave in a physical context? And the truth is that many people will overlook that and perhaps feel obligated to respond positively because they don't want to hurt the person's feelings. So that lack of consent gets skipped over and ignored and it starts to build. Really, I don't think we should be using a separate set of boundaries for our in-person interactions and another for our digital interactions. If you wouldn't accept your dates pulling down their pants and flashing their genitals to you on a dinner date, why would you accept that when you're just getting to know each other online? Anyway, slight segue. Back to Gerard. A lot of the time, people simply don't know what the best way is to respond to these situations. Recently, I've seen some people shaming the senders of unsolicited nude images online by screenshotting the images they sent and posting them to their social media. I asked Gerard what he would recommend as the best way to respond to unsolicited nude images received online. 
So I personally, just from a threat assessment point of view, wouldn't wouldn't recommend humiliating someone like that. You don't know anything about the person behind that message that was sent to you, that picture. You don't know their state of mind. You don't know their personality. You know, are they a vindictive person? What skills do they have? Maybe from a cyber point of view. And that is just really trying to kick in the hornet's nest. So I know there's one lawyer I know who does a lot of social media stuff. And she's always like, no, if this happens, we name and shame, we put it in public, we do this. But how do you know that that might not cause that person to decide, well, you've taken everything from me. You've destroyed my life. I've lost my job. They're going to blame you. They're not going to say, this is my own fault. I shouldn't have done this. They can just as well blame you and decide, I'm going to do something to you. So that's why I would just always recommend that if you're getting unsolicited messages, just block, don't even respond. Or if you feel the urge you need to do something, it's just to say, please don't contact me ever again. I do not want it. I do not want any messages at all. The only reason why I would say doing that is because, again, in court, if you do end up needing to take a protection order, it's not a requirement that you have to have told the person, don't send me these nude pictures. But it does, I think, I do think it helps in the, in the magistrate's mind because it's very clear that you didn't want this to happen. But it's not a legal requirement for you to tell that to the person. But to engage them, to harass them, to threaten them, to try and chat with them, to see who they are, no. You're just really giving the person what, what, what they often want, which is some kind of interaction with you. Even being sworn at is a form of response and interaction. And if they're doing this because they want to make your life miserable, then they know that they're doing that. So keep whatever messages for evidence, evidence purposes, if you ever decide to take the matter further, store them somewhere, screenshot them, whatever you want to do. For sure, block the guy, don't respond. And, and hopefully the person will just move on to somebody who is going to give him what he wants out of the interaction. Something that stood out for me with the Brian Harvey case was his apparent interest in young females. He mentioned his underage neighbours, for instance, and often referred to his victim's young daughters in his messages. I asked Gerard whether this ever concerned him as being indicative of possible paedophilic tendencies, or if perhaps younger girls were just less threatening than older women. No, I, I was concerned about it, and that's, I think, when we did our search warrant, we included uh, child pornography in the search warrant that we were looking for. Uh, and on his devices. Because again, what you display in your fantasy world reflects things you're very often interested in. So that definitely was a concern that this, you know, could he have an addition to his, you know, adult interests? Um, could there be a risk for child pornography or a sexual interest in children? We, we didn't find anything uh, of that nature on his devices. Uh, you would have been charged with it if we had, but it was because, I mean, if you mention, you know, getting aroused by young prepubescent children watching you, that's definitely, if it's sexually arousing, could this be a feature of your sexual interests? I mean, why else would you need to mention it unless you were trying to cause fear in your victim? Which, and I don't think Brian Harvey's goal was to make his victims scared. I think it was for him about the sexual excitement of what he was doing. In the book, Gerard refers to an element of pseudo-intimacy that he saw in Harvey's messages, where he mentioned personal details about the victims he was stalking to almost create this faux real-world connection. This reminded me of the pseudo-relationship behaviour that we've heard many rapists often exhibit with their victims. I wondered whether the psychology behind these two are pretty similar in terms of the offender wanting to turn their act into something more acceptable to them. Yeah, I think that. And I mean, probably in his little fantasy world, a victim, like he describes in his fantasy about the doctor and this um, would be responding, um, and then he could engage with this behavior. Whether we'd ultimately want to meet them, I, I don't know. But I do think it does make it less guilt feelings for you if you're trying to sort of set it up as something mutual. And of course, if the victim does then respond in a sort of responsive way where they kind of go with the flow, so to speak, I suppose that makes it easier for him to still keep things anonymous, to perhaps get the sexual excitement that he's hoping I think that would have been a, a definite bonus for him if, if the victims had said, hey, I like this. Let's, let's continue sending messages back to each other and saying the things we're saying. When discussing stalking in general in the book, Gerard mentions that female stalkers he's seen, although less common, are often far more obsessive in their behaviour patterns. 
I asked him whether he thought we really have a good grasp on how many men are being stalked, or if they're perhaps not reporting, because they'll be taken even less seriously than female victims. I think probably that, that they'll, they'll be taken less seriously. I mean, we don't even have an indication how many females have been stalked because we don't have a stalking law, you know. One could try and use, for example, protection orders as some measure, that not, not that all protection orders were as a result of stalking like this. So I just think that it's a massively unknown figure. And I mean, like you say, if you, if you ask your female friends, have you guys ever received an unsolicited message or picture? from someone. And I think most ladies will say, yeah, I've received a few of those over my life. I just ignored it and carried on and it, it went away. Um, so I think we kind of don't really, we downplay it and we often don't even necessarily realize that that's stalking behavior. So it's a massive donk dock figure, um, to use that term. Um, and I think for men, whether men are more likely just to say, oh, bugger this, if it's not directly impacting their lives negatively um, and not worry as, as much about it, from a safety point of view than females. But also I think, yeah, it is realistic to think that a lot of males would be maybe embarrassed to say, I'm having this person harassing me and it's scaring me and I want to do something. One of the cases discussed in the book is the murder of Michael van Eyck. I covered that case on the podcast and it was undoubtedly one of the most gruesome and hard hitting cases I've covered. One of the perpetrators, Shane van Heerden, would go on to become the first female classified as a dangerous offender in South Africa. In the book, Gerard relays that he was all set to interview her at one point when she changed her mind. This isn't the first time this has happened, and I wondered whether once these offenders understand that he has the tools and experience at his disposal to possibly understand them better than most other people, maybe that scares them because he might reveal things that they don't want anyone to know, or perhaps even things they don't want to know about themselves. So I think it's a, it can be both ways. I think what often why they do initially confess and say what they've done is because they are finally able to sit and talk to someone about these things that they've not been able to speak to anybody about. Um, but I suppose on the other hand, it could have the opposite effect, like you say, and they might feel like I don't want this person who understands my deepest thoughts to, to know my deepest thoughts. So I think it might just be developed, you know, based on the individual. But as I said, we've had a lot of these people who do talk quite openly about what they've done quite easily uh, at the time of their arrest. In that chapter, Gerard discusses fantasy and in particular violent sexual fantasies, in quite a lot of detail. And he mentions that violent sexual fantasies are more common than we might think. I asked him, for the ordinary person on the street, at what points should they be concerned about violent sexual fantasies they may be having? Or is the line simply, if you aren't trying to act on it in a non-consensual context, then it's nothing to worry about? I think the basic thing is, you know, if do you have any other nonviolent sexual fantasies? Because as I said, the research shows us that healthy normal people have both nonviolent and might have not not everybody, but you know, and might also have some some violent sexual fantasies every now and then. And so as long as there's a balance that you've got normal ones and and sort of if you want to have the more unusual ones, um, and you're not you know acting it out with a non-consenting person, then that's fine. I suppose if it comes more preoccupying of, you know, and you start to have less and less of the sort of straightforward nonviolent sexual fantasies, and you do have this more desire to go out and act it out, then I mean, that change in your own attitude towards them, um, I mean, I suppose that would be an area of concern that, you know, you might want to go to speak to a professional about. But yeah, I think that's, you know, as I said, we don't want to police people's thoughts. But if there's a risk that this is moving towards you acting them out, then that's always going to be something of concern that we'd like to prevent from happening. Another really fascinating case Gerard discusses in the book, he refers to as the King of America, and it revolves around a threat that was made against the life of the then American President Barack Obama when he was on South African soil, which happened as a result of delusional thought patterns that the person making the threats, Sean Fruin, was experiencing. One of the reasons I think it was a really good inclusion is because it's really relevant to a lot of what we saw happening around the pandemic 
and people becoming so utterly convinced of some of their theories around that. I wondered at what point someone should be concerned if their family member is displaying some delusional thinking around the topic. Yeah, I mean, that's always a challenge. You know, we also get what we call overvalued thoughts or overvalued thinking, which is not yet sort of quite a delusional level. But, and we saw that a lot of the pandemic, a lot of people were quite, you know, convinced that Bill Gates has something to do with this, uh, that the vaccine causes the disease, et cetera. You know, wouldn't necessarily refer them delusional, but these were definitely pretty much fixed beliefs that they had. I think it becomes a problem when it starts to interfere with your life and inter impact upon your functioning, you know, where you're starting to become isolated by everybody because they just don't want to hear this nonsense. Uh, or when it starts to, you know, interfere with your, your ability to earn a living and your functioning, um, your family start to reject you. I think then when it sort of impacts on your sort of socioeconomic circumstances, you know, then we have to start looking at this. This is now becoming a problem. So I mean, all, I mean, I know a lot of very normal people that have some, when you touch on some issues, I mean, politics is always a good one. When you kind of think, how on earth can you have that belief? You know, you, you seem like such a normal person, but you believe one, two, and three. You know, and, and if, like I say, if it's starting to impact upon your social functioning, your family life in a negative way, you know, then one might start to want to go, go speak to someone about, you know, the, about these things. But again, very often these people believe, but I'm not the one who's wrong. Everybody else is wrong. So why should I go see somebody? So it's quite difficult when, when it comes to beliefs that people have that are, you know, problematic. I think one of the most fascinating things about Sean Fruin was how utterly logical his arguments were. He was quite tactical about how he phrased his threats to push just the right buttons. And the mental illness element only really started to come through when he expressed in one communication how he was the only one in the world with the solution to the issue he perceived, almost touting himself as some sort of messiah. But before that, you'd be forgiven for almost nodding and agreeing with him. No, I mean, this philosophy had been going since the 80s. And, you know, one, one also does one, and you never really function very well occupationally in anything. You know, you get a bit of success, and then it would be as if all the house of cards fell apart. So, I mean, there, there, there seems like there were other sort of difficulties he, he was facing. But in this particular case, it's, it's it, yeah, I mean, it developed for many years, just became a problem when he decided that he needs to do more to get his attention. And that was obviously just a very, turned out to be a very self-destructive way. So that lack of insight that, you know, even though nobody's listening to me, you know, the, the way I want to go about it now in phase three is going to be more destructive than it's worth. Um, and that that's, I suppose, when you can say it really became a concern or maybe moved over from being an overvalued belief um, that there's this legal loophole to something maybe more on a delusional level. Another thing that I found quite important about Sean's case was that it showed how valuable psychological assessments can be in criminal cases. We often feel like the justice system is treating offenders softly or looking to excuse their behaviour when offenders are sent for psychological evaluations prior to trial. But in Sean's case, it showed that there really would be absolutely no value in him serving prison time for his offence. Yeah, I mean, he's doing really, really great now. I actually had a chat about two or three nights ago, he phoned me. Um, and he was quite adamant that he wants to show that, you know, going for help can really help and made a difference in his life and he's happy and he's you know not getting into trouble and he's you know carrying feels very much at peace etc but i mean the issue of people like saying that you know you're just trying to get out of it you know the people that assess these offend the potential offenders at the hospital you know they do this on a for a daily living they're not idiots you know and the majority of people that get sent for some kind of mental observation after having committed a violent or serious crime the overwhelming majority are found fit to stand trial and are put on trial. You know, uh, that includes people that sometimes have mental illnesses, like uh, from the first book in Chongwana, you know, who had a documented history of, of mental illness issues, but still was found fit to stand trial. And also in the Velcom case, uh, you know, Martins van der a documented history of schizophrenia prior to the murders, but it wasn't found to be the reason why he committed the crime. So I would like to say that you're not easily going to get off through a mental health kind of defense for any crime you've committed because the people who do this do this on a daily basis they're not idiots 
you know, they don't just go, oh, you say you're hearing a voice or you're schizophrenic, you're not responsible. They need far more proof and evidence than that. And that's difficult to fake. I asked Gerard whether he thinks there might be a Profiler Diaries 3 in the works. And he says he's not too sure about that, as he's concerned he might not have many more cases in which he had personal involvement while he was with the SAPS that have both the level of detail he'd like as well as public interest. Personally, I don't think that this will be the last book we see from the pen of Dr. Gerard Labuskakny, and I certainly hope it won't. Gerard also has his own podcast, Profiler Africa, in which he discusses cases with journalist Paul Llewellyn. You can find that podcast wherever you're listening to True Crime South Africa, and I highly recommend it. He also runs his own YouTube channel, which is dedicated to his personal passion of firearms, so if that's something that interests you, definitely head over and subscribe to that channel. It's called Zulu Alpha Firearms. Gerard's website is also a wealth of information, with links to many of the interviews he's done over the years, and a whole page of downloadable resources, including academic papers, which the true crime geek in me got far too excited over. His website is forensic-psychologist.co.za, or you can Google his name, and in one of the many results, you'll likely find his website too. If you haven't yet ordered or read Gerard's book, The Profiler Diaries 2, I'm not sure what you're waiting for, but you need to do that. It's insightful, interesting, and everything a true crime fan could ask for. As always, it was an enormous pleasure to interview Dr. Labaskakni, and I hope you found value in this interview too. Thank you for listening to my interview with Dr. Gerard Labaskakni author of The Profiler Diaries 2, From Crime Scene to Courtroom. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. 